When looking back at the birth of wartime strategy games, most people's minds go back to the utterly fantastic Command & Conquer series, or 1992's June 2. But of course, it goes back a lot further than that. The real-time strategy or RTS genre has so many twists and turns that there is no definitive answer. Herzog's Y seems to be the go-to original RTS for most, a Japanese-created 1989 Mega Drive slash Genesis title, but again, it really does depend on how you look at it. Regardless, one company that did bring quite a lot to the table in their own twisted way were the bedroom coders turned British video game development legends, Sensible Software with the often overlooked by the majority of the world, Megalomania, and, I suppose, Cannon Fodder. Megalomania was the first ever game with a tech tree in it, the very first in the world. At the time Cannon Fodder was launched, there was a bit of a power war going on between Virgin US and Virgin Europe. We went out to the States to show the American guys Cannon Fodder, but all they wanted to do was show us Westwood and Tune. The disrespect for what we had achieved with Cannon Fodder was extremely annoying. The only reason Cannon Fodder didn't sell in the US is that they didn't promote it. They promoted Dune 2 instead. Again, they were not the first, but they were important in helping shape one of the most important computer game genres to ever exist. And today on Slopes Game Room, I plan to cover the complete history of Cannon Fodder. Without a doubt, my personal favourite game that the studio ever put out. But of course, for us to do so correctly, we need to go back to the beginning and discover how a company started by a couple of teenage stoners ended up churning out a seriously unique, controversial, legendary and sadly forgotten by some outside of the UK video game. This is the complete history of Cannon Fodder. Welcome to Slopes Game Room. Our story starts back in the mid 80s where a young John Hare and Chris Yates, two friends at a school in Essex, decided that the best thing to do when they finished their education was to start a band. And then they quickly realised that that wasn't the best idea. Thankfully, gaming was the backup, and at only 19 years old, Chris, who wasn't that bad at programming, and John, who wasn't that bad at art and design, got themselves a job creating ports for a company called LT Software in Essex. Several games got worked on by the two, such as Flyer Fox and Trivial Pursuit. However, it was when they made their own game, Twister, Mother of Charlotte, an obscure yet well-made um, Space Harrier-like game, I suppose, that a couple of light bulbs exploded above the young devs' heads. We realised that we were doing all the work, whilst LT Software was getting 85% of the money. And because of this, the two started their own video game company using funds from a government enterprise scheme, and they set up shop at Chris's parents' house in the spare room. They started working on their first game called Parallax after signing a deal with industry legends, Ocean Software. Now, Parallax, as impressive as it was and critically acclaimed as it was, wasn't exactly pulling in big numbers. A game that is respected for what it brought to the gaming table, but the most important thing to take away from this is that it showed that not only were these boys capable of making well respected games, but they made these games that very few others could make in the same way. Sensible Software, as they were now known, didn't just go and make another shmup like everyone else would have done. They did things their own way. Sure, it had shoot 'em up elements, but it also included exploration, top down shooting, and resource management. This isn't an easy game to get to grips with, and on paper, it sounds unplayable. The sort of thing you can expect to hear from the mind of a kid who wants to make his first ever video game and he just has to include elements of everything they're currently playing at the time, with the end result being an unplayable mess. But somehow, Sensible Software would always make it work. The way Sensi went about making their games is that Chris would code something simple yet intriguing, they would then swap seats and John would make it look pretty, or 
vice versa. This back and forth would happen over and over again, adding cool ideas along the way and taking away elements that didn't work, resulting in a game that didn't start its life as a design document, but instead something truly unique that I'm sure they didn't expect to end up with. The same can be said for follow-ups like Whizball, a bouncy ball-like shooter where you control a moody, troll-like looking face thing trying to save his world by filling it up with colour. Again, it just doesn't make sense on paper, and it doesn't control all that great either. But give it time and you will end up with something, yet again, truly special. So much so that a lot of people look at this game right here, Whizball, as one of the greatest games ever released for the Commodore 64. This trend would continue and Sensible Software grew from strength to strength, creating games that just couldn't be categorised into one genre. They of course did a load of <coughs> standard games too, but as you would expect, these were really just made for the ease of doing so to complete contracts with certain publishers that the team had signed into. Regardless, the memorable games were the ones where they seemed to add just enough to make something uncommon, yet at the same time not add too much to make something feel overwhelming. This brings them to their biggest game to date, Mega Lomania. Now, I'm not going to get into exactly what Megalomania is, because the answer is not simple, plus it does deserve its own video, as does Whizball. What's really important for this video and the creation of Cad and Fodder though, is not exactly what this game is, but more so how this game was released. You see, by this point, Sensible Software had pumped out a whole heap of games for a whole heap of different publishers. Some were quick and easy for companies like Houston Consultants, with the Defender clone known as Insects in Space, whilst others like Micropose had a bit more time spent on them with Micropose Soccer. But none of them held a candle to the amount of effort that went into Megalomania. A real-time strategy game of sorts before the genre was really known that was created in order to take full advantage of the Commodore Amiga. A serious jump up in possibilities from the Commodore 64. The team wanted to create something truly exceptional for the newer hardware and in short, they did that exact thing. There was just one problem. As loved as the game was, it wasn't easy to buy, as Mirasoft, the publisher, had just declared bankruptcy almost as soon as the game was released, following the death of Robert Maxwell that in turn completely destroyed all of the companies attached to his name and as a result obliterated the release of what is a truly exceptional and groundbreaking game. Good friend of the show and easily one of the greatest, if not the best, retro gaming YouTuber on the platform, Kim Justice, goes into far more detail than this dedicated Canon Fodder video does about these two companies. So if you want to find out more about Mirasoft or Sensible Software outside of Canon Fodder, then definitely go and check out her channel. You won't regret it. Anyway, when it comes down to Cannon Fodder in particular, how does all of this lead up to this particular game? Well, John, Chris, and of course the rest of the Sensible Software team, a studio that had built up a more than worthy, reputable name for themselves, had hit an unlikely brick wall, with Megalomania not bringing in the money that it should have done off the back of the soon-to-be-dead Mirasoft publishing house. John and Chris found themselves just going to the bank, begging for a loan to help them get through the deep hole that Mirasoft had unfortunately left them in. But sadly, the bank wasn't too impressed with the two floppy disks that the company brought along. They promised them that two hugely popular upcoming games sat coded on the magnetic diskettes found in the plastic casing, but they weren't having any of it. Which was a shame, because on disk one, you had the most popular game the company ever put out, Sensible Soccer, and then on disk two, yes, obviously, you had Cannon fodder. And although at the time the studio didn't exactly know just how popular these games were going to be, what they did know was they had something truly special here with these two games. 
Legal battles commenced between Sensible Software and the dying Mirasoft company that still had them contracted for another free games, and thankfully for this episode, Mirasoft lost, leaving Sensi with the ability to go looking elsewhere for new publishers, and this time they were going to be doing so whilst keeping hold of their intellectual properties. Thankfully, Virgin were the guys that helped them along with Cannon Fodder, Ocean gave them an advance of a WizKid and even more obscure follow up to WizBall, and Renegade did the same for Sensible Soccer. Now by this point, what I've managed to piece together from different interviews was that WizKid, the smallest game of the three being developed, was the one that was the most complete by this point. Sensible Soccer came in second place, but of course that had the most attention onto it. And then in third place, a distant third place, you had Cannon Fodder. Stu Cambridge and Jules Jameson, a couple of newcomers to the company who joined in 1991, got to work on Cannon Fodder, and by 1992, John himself was a lot more involved with the production of the game as it ramped its development up into first gear. Originally, the idea spawned from the video game Rambo, starting off with a simple couple of pixelated blobs on the screen inspired by the little characters found in games like Lemmings, in fact, the game's working title in its early days was Lemmings with Weapons. The team quickly worked out that adding a small formation of characters shooting every which way quickly helped it become, yet again, its own unique thing. Of course, as production continued on, it gained plenty of that wacky, sensible software charm, with the characters gaining a bit more of a cartoony look, especially compared to Sensible Soccer and, of course, Megalomania. And this was apparently down to Stu, being a lot more interested in that field. And unlike their earlier work besides Megalomania, this game required a whole lot more work and pre-planning to make sure that each level was not only completable, but also offered up a new gaming experience the further you got into the game. From a design point of view, it's quite calculated. I remember drawing the maps with coloured pencils in a Chelmsford library, and we worked out all the features of the game at the start. Traps, spikes, tanks, and things you could climb into. I made a conscious effort to ensure that in every level of cannon fodder, you saw something new. Which most definitely helps with a game like this. The grown-up shoot-em-up, similar to more popular games like Commando, but not really. Yes, at its core, it's a vertical scrolling run and gun shooter, and yes, just like the Ninja, which I will always bring up whenever I get the chance, you spend a lot of your time frantically on the edge of your seat, shooting all over the place, doing what you can to keep your character alive. But the difference, and the genius to the gameplay itself at least, comes with its more tactical approach to the genre. More often than not, you need to plan your moves ahead of time, using a mouse. Yes, a mouse. Controllers work too on other consoles, but for the true optimal experience, all you console kids need to learn how to play this game with a mouse. This clever little box is called a mouse, and it's linked up to an arrow on the screen called a cursor. Uh, you'll get used to it. The left click of your mouse ran towards, away, or to take cover, whilst the right mouse button shoots in the desired direction, and then pushing both buttons together at the same time will shoot off a secondary weapon. It's a fairly easy game to control and play before it becomes brutally hard, but it never feels unfair. You will die in this game, and you will die a lot, and unlike pretty much every other single warlike game that came before it, the death of the teammates will be far more painful here than it ever was before. Or not, it depends on what kind of gamer you are. For me, it gives off the same sort of reaction when playing newer games like Pikmin. In fact, Cannon Fodder's the only other game that's given off that same emotion. When your small army gets trampled, eaten or squashed, you are the one to blame for their death. It's annoying when your teammates die in games like Worms, but in Cannon Fodder, it's not annoying, it's gut-wrenching. Every time a level ends, you get to see the names of the fallen. You may not know them personally, but you controlled them, and you were the one responsible for the death of that individual. Furthermore, the unsuspecting line of troops ready to go into battle as they circle the poppy-filled boot hill that will slowly fill up with the graves of the fallen is further punishment to the way that you play and the actions you made these troops take. 
Again, every player is going to see this different, but for me, the more I see, the more I failed. The better your troops perform in the game, the higher the rank they go, which of course results in slightly different gravestones too. I am of course painting a rather bleak picture on a game that at its core is a beautiful and very addictive war game. Even during development, John and the team at Sensible Software never intended to take its anti-war messaging too seriously. After all, it is just a video game, a cartoony video game at that. The CD32 version even included a tongue-in-cheek music video of sorts where the development team can be seen prancing around a poppy field in fancy dress pretending to shoot plastic guns at each other. And of course, they do that exact thing over the super catchy poppy intro music. Created by John Hare himself, this funky reggae-like track is not only a real earworm, but with everything else already stated, turns the game from serious to charming, cute and fun. But still, it's easy to see why so many people did take offence with this game, especially considering it included a poppy front and centre, not just on the title screen, but originally on the box art too. Now, for those that don't know, the poppy is a symbol of remembrance to those that fell during the war and is worn by the vast majority to show support for the armed forces community. It also symbolises a peaceful future and has since become a yearly tradition on the 11th of November. However, with that said, some people see it as simply a sign of remorse for those fallen. And that's exactly why it was shown off in this game. A game that, like no other before it, made the player feel remorse for those fallen. Sadly, however, for those that didn't know about what was going on in the game, all they saw was a picture of a poppy surrounded by the words cannon fodder, a derogatory term used for soldiers who were forced by their military command to go out into battle knowing full well that they are likely to never return. They are simply nothing more than expendable flesh shields for the greater good. All of a sudden, that jokey dancing around the poppy field, the cartoony look of the game and the catchy pop song with the lyrics, war's never been so much fun, takes a much darker tone. Especially considering the game was promoted on the 11th of November. This resulted in news outlets ripping on the game and even the Royal British Legion themselves getting involved, forcing Sensible Software to change the front cover from that of a poppy to a soldier and making the first thing you see when booting up the game be a splash screen with the words, this game is not in any way endorsed by the Royal British Legion. They also needed to pay up £500 in order to keep the Royal British Legion's mouth shut, which of course, Chris and John instantly paid up. Thankfully, even with all of this backlash, the game itself obviously did fantastic numbers and has since been seen as the anti-war masterpiece that was simply misunderstood by the media who most definitely never played it at the time. With the success of Cannon Fodder, Cannon Fodder 2 was inevitable. The follow-up to the smash hit game came in barely a year after the original and this time, John, who painstakingly mapped out every single one of the 70 plus levels on graph paper, wasn't around, or at least he wasn't as closely connected to this game as he once was before. The time to pass on the development duties to other members of staff had finally come. And with Cannon Fodder doing brilliantly on other systems that used a controller instead of a mouse, it was time to take the far more cartoony look of those ports and go wild with it, it seems. And one of the first steps towards the completion of this game was to bring on Stuart Campbell of Amiga Power magazine. Sensible rang me up one day in the Amiga Power office and said, do you fancy coming to work for us? 
They were a bit vague about the job specifics. To be fair, that was still the case when I was actually doing the job. But they made me an offer I couldn't refuse, and that was that when I got there, Cannon Fodder 2 was my first task. As a huge fan of the original game, Stuart wanted to get involved and was the creator of no less than 60 of the 70 plus levels himself. This was important because as much as he loved the charm, the controls and the gameplay of the original, he hated the sudden jump up in difficulty that the game laid on you when you got to level 8. John still stands by it, but to uh, many gamers out there that never got past level 8, yeah, they're with Stuart on this one. Time travel was already agreed upon before Stuart joined, so all Stuart really needed to do was make the first game, but better. He wasn't a fan of the overly large play areas or the risk of pushing through water to suddenly just get shot with little to do to fight back, so of course, these were the first to go. I absolutely hated going in the water in the first game. It was slow and annoying and unfair and unrealistic. I mean, if you're crossing a river and someone starts shooting at you, you wouldn't just stand there getting wet and dead, would you? It made no sense that you didn't just lift your rifle to shoulder height and fire, and since there was nothing I could do to let the troopers fire from the water, the obvious solution was to not have them go into any water in the first place. I wanted the sequel to be all meat, all action, no padding. And I wanted it to start off hard and get steadily harder, not have half a dozen levels of tutorial and suddenly fling you off a cliff. And that is exactly what we got. It doesn't hold as much weight or love as the original, with surreal settings forcing it to be surprisingly more forgettable than the original, but all in all, it did what it set out to do. It gave fans more cannon fodder in an extremely short space of time, and the levels all felt far more arcadey this time around too. To many, the sequel felt more like an add-on pack than any kind of real worthy sequel, and sure they did wind up a few people, including John himself in retrospect, but all in all, it's not bad. Heck, to the right sort of gamer, it is the better game. Nostalgia has won over the original for me for so, so, so many years, but there is no denying that Cannon Fodder 2 is a great game. When I went back and played it, I had a blast. It's way more fast and frantic than the original, and dare I say it, it's far more pick up and play too. It's not better, it's just more. More of the action and suspense, and to the right sort of gamer, that's all it ever needed to be. Stuart, however, wanted more. When he joined Sensi, the level designs, as wacky as they were, had no real reason as to why you were in them fighting away. In the original game, putting soldiers in deserts and jungle scenarios worked, and it made sense, but here, with its futuristic, alien-like and sometimes historic settings, it didn't. The only thing he got told when he joined was that the soldiers are time-travelling, and that's that. Because of this, with his writing background, Stuart went ahead and tried to tie it all together with an elaborate story as he explains himself on his very own website. I actually got several chapters into writing a novella designed to accompany the game. The names of the alien races, etc. were all taken from Stereolab records. A short chapter, one or two pages, for each of the 72 missions, with the idea that you'd read each chapter at the start of each mission, since there was no possible way of squeezing detailed, explanatory stuff into the code itself. At that point, Virgin decided it would be all much too expensive and canned the idea. These were the end days for the Amiga as a major revenue source for the big game publishers, and anything which added even pennies to a game's budget was frowned upon as an unnecessary obstacle to squeezing the maximum possible amount of money out of the platform before abandoning it. Virgin took the task of producing the manual upon themselves and came up with a five minute hack job, vaguely alluding to some nonsense about being mercenaries, which didn't even mention time travel. Yeah. Thankfully, yet again, considering this game came out right near the end of the Amiga's life, it did fine numbers-wise, and it got great reviews, which was great. And that leads us to the final game in the trilogy, Cannon Fodder 3. However, before we get there, it's probably worth mentioning everything else. Also, what do you guys think of the t-shirt? It's from Vapor95, and you can get yourself this and plenty of other awesome designs by going to the Vapor95 website using the link below, along with code SLOPESGAMEROOM15. Of course, by doing so, not only will you look as pathetically pleasing as me, but you will be supporting the channel too. Anyway, thanks for listening, guys. Let's carry on with Cannon Fodder The Complete History. 
Let's carry on with this. Canon Soccer. This was a giveaway game that featured a couple of exclusive levels, primarily a sensible soccer inspired stage. You got iCanon fodder, not its final name, thankfully. This was, of course, a mobile phone game adaption or new game entirely that never really got off the ground. And Canon Fodder 3, as in not the released version of Canon Fodder 3. This one was actually the first proper time a sequel started development within the world of 3D. The PSP exclusive game was being developed by an unknown studio in London with funding coming in from Codemasters who had purchased sensible software at the end of the company's life and therefore all of its intellectual properties too. Sadly, as good as this game was coming along according to John himself, it too was sadly cancelled and he went into more detail about this on a Cubed Free interview. It does upset me that three times we started that project. It was a good project, good design, we had an extremely good team in London to develop it. Unfortunately, through no fault of their own, Codemasters hit economic problems and had to sell the studio, so everything just went. Times had changed, the days of working out a game as you go along were pretty much gone. In fact, they've only really come back nowadays thanks to the explosion that is the indie retro gaming scene. But even then, it's an oversaturated market and you've got to wonder whether Canon fodder would ever work in this day and age. Codemasters still own it, but they were doing nothing with it. That was until Game Factory Interactive Limited, or at least the Russian leg of the company, reached out to Codemasters to make a true Canon fodder free game, which Codemasters did accept, unfortunately. Look. Okay, Canon Fodder 3 isn't that bad. It plays how you would expect it to play for the most part. However, the juddery camera and zoomed in controls just don't make it feel as accurate or top tier compared to the originals. Heck, look, it might have taken longer to develop, who knows, but the end result doesn't feel like it. It looks cheap, kind of like Canon Fodder Jr which is a real shame. The artwork is okay, the design is on the right path, and as stated, it does play mostly like the originals. It does have its moments and shouldn't be completely forgotten, that is if you can get past some of the worst translations and voice acting this side of Zero Wing. But all in all, for the majority of retro gamers out there that remember the original two, it simply just doesn't hold a candle to them. Worth checking out if you really do need some more cannon for your fodder. However, I would just say go back to those original two, or if you really, really need a little bit more, go and check out the open source game called Open Fodder. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the complete history of Canon Fodder. An extremely well-loved series here in the UK, however a series that is mostly forgotten in other parts of the world, due to the American leg of Virgin not promoting it correctly and then of course, Sensible themselves probably not doing the right thing themselves when creating the quote-unquote sequel. Still, to those that do remember, it is a legendary game that almost no other game has managed to tackle since in the same way. Very few games managed to portray the horrors of war quite like this, with really only This War of Mine and Valiant Hearts coming to mind. But still, those games are very much in your face, whereas that original cannon fodder, sure it provided some good on the edge of your seat arcade and RTS-like action, but it left you feeling a little uncomfortable too, as the slow John Hare ballad originally created after the breakup of his ex plays in all of its original Amiga glory, showcasing a scene of clueless recruits going into war under the shadow of their fallen comrades on Boot Hill. And hey, if all of that just went over your head as a youngster, it is still simply a bloody good game. 